I am Brother Stephen Elabo, welcoming you to the Life Bible Church, Charlottesville, United States, a place where the undiluted Word of God is being preached. You are about to listen to our general superintendent, Pastor W.F. Kumoye, as a comfort to share the mind of God with you and your family. I want you to be ready to pick up your pen and your paper and jot down important messages as they will do you good. God bless you and remain blessed. Malachi chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 1. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Behold, I will send my messenger. Here is the Lord talking to the children of Israel. And he's talking to the people of Judah. And he says, Behold, I will send my messenger. Actually, the children of Israel or the people of Judah, they have been wondering. If you look at the last chapter, that is in chapter 2 and in verse 17, the last line there, and where is the God of judgment? They were confused in their lives. They saw the wicked prospering, and they saw the people that were righteous. It's like they were not claiming the inheritance, and things were not going on well for them. And then they were saying, where is the God of justice? Where is the God of judgment? And they were saying, it appears the wicked are doing good. That's why they said, if you look at the middle part of that verse, when, when ye say, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord. What do they mean by that? They were saying, the people that are doing evil, the people that are sinning, the people that are backsliding, the people that are worshipping their idols, it's like they're making it. They, look, they were looking at the uh, peripheral things. They were looking at the superficial things. They were looking at the things that were visible. And he said, the people that were doing evil, they appear good in your sight. And then they went on to say, he is, and he delighted also in them. He seems to be blessing them. They didn't realize that the goodness of God was to bring them to repentance. They didn't realize that it's a good God, a wonderful God that makes his ruin to come on the just and the unjust and makes the sun to shine upon the just and the unjust. And so they were asking, where is the God of judgment? Now God comes in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Behold, I will send my messenger. And actually, I hope you understood, but I hope you understand, the name Malachi actually means my messenger. Think about that. And the Lord was saying, I am sending my messenger unto you. I'm sending Malachi to you. And Malachi will tell you what happened in the past, what you are doing now, and what is coming in the future. It goes beyond that number two. I will send my messenger. He also spoke about John the Baptist, because John the Baptist is referred to as the messenger of the Lord. I will send my messenger. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 11. As you look at Matthew chapter 11, here we're looking at uh, verse 10 and verse 11. Matthew chapter 11, and we're reading from verses 10 and 11. It says, for this is he of whom it is written, behold, I will send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And what is the God of judgment? What is the God of justice? Behold, I will send my messenger. Number one, I'll send Malachi to you. He is my messenger. Number two, I will send John the Baptist. And here is what is written. It says in this verse 10, that this is he of whom it was written, I'm sending my messenger very late. Verse 11, I say unto you, among them which are born of women, there has not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, this is wonderful for me. I say this one is wonderful for, for you. He that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Thank God, God puts a great value upon your life. And it says the least in the kingdom. Even if you count yourself as the least in the kingdom, it says you are greater than John the Baptist. Let us come to Mark 
chapter 1, and I'm reading from verses 2 and 3. In fulfillment of the promise of God that I will send my messenger, Mark chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, as it is written in the prophet. Which prophet is written in Malachi? As it is written in Malachi, behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And then as you come to Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, reading here from verse 76. Luke chapter 1, verse 76, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, a prophesying and then speaking to the people when John the Baptist was born. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, and thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. That's according to what he had been told by the angel before John was born. John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, I'm reading from verses uh, 6 and 7. It says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. I pray that you'll be such a man. That you'll see, there was a man, there was a woman sent from God whose name was, tell him your name. And then it says, the same came for a witness to hear, to, to bear witness of the light. And that all men through him might believe. God will do wonders through your life. That as you become the messenger of the Lord yourself, and then the Spirit of God is upon you, and the power of the Lord is upon you, and everything you do for the Lord will be blessed of him and draw souls into the kingdom in Jesus' name. Well, we, you know, over here in our church, we say there are members, there are workers. And actually, there shouldn't have been any kind of difference between uh, the member and the worker. It says, uh, follow me, and I will make you complete it for me. I'll make you fisher, uh, fishers of me. That means the moment you stand up and the moment you say, I'm going to belong to the Lord. I follow the Lord. I'm following the Lord. He says his goal for you is to be a fisher of me. Is to make you a minister. Is to make you a messenger. I'm going to ask you a question. Now you become a Christian for two years and three years and five years. Are you going to remain, let me use the word, an ordinary member? coming in, going out, until you die. Until you die. And he said that his purpose of calling you is that he will make you his messenger. And the people are asking, where are the evangelists and where is the goodness of God? Where are the people that will help us? And they ask the question, where is the God of judgment and the God of justice? And the God that will show us mercy, he said, I'll send my messenger to you. That community where you are living, he has sent you as a messenger. You will perform very well there in Jesus' name. Number one, if you come back to Malachi, Malachi chapter 3. Number one, Malachi himself was a messenger, the messenger of the Lord. The name meant my messenger. Number two, it was, it was also referring to John the Baptist. And then come back now to Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. It says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord Look at this, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. He's not talking about another person. He's talking about Jesus Christ. He's talking about the Lord. And he says, the Lord whom you are seeking, he will suddenly appear in his temple. And what does he refer to that? What does he say about that, about that uh, messenger? He says, even the messenger of the covenant. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He refers to him as Lord. He said, my messenger, Malachi, my messenger, John the Baptist, and then another messenger now is the Lord whom you seek, who will suddenly appear in his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in, behold, he shall come. Behold, he shall come. Behold, he shall come. The Lord is coming. I said, the Lord is coming, says the Lord of 
host. He's referred to as the messenger of the covenant and is the Lord himself. Look at Psalm 110. I'm reading here from verse 1, Psalm 110. And we're reading from verse 1, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ that he is coming. He is Lord. He is God also. You remember, after Jesus rose from the dead, and then he came to his disciples, and he said, Peace be unto you. Thomas was not there. And then eight days after, one week after, Jesus Christ appeared to them again and said, Thomas, come here and look at my hand and look at my side and thrust your finger, thrust your hand in my side. And uh, Thomas realized this is Jesus. He died and then he was buried and he rose again. And Thomas bent down and worshipped him and said, My Lord and my God. And Jesus did not say, uh-uh, don't say, you know, when an angel bowed down, or sorry, and when John the Beloved, when he bowed down to an angel, the angel said, no, no, you can't do that, because I'm just a man like yourself. But when Thomas said, my Lord and my God, Jesus didn't say, uh-uh, don't say that, because he's Lord. You call me Master and Lord, and so I am. And so here we're reading in Psalm 110, and I'm reading verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, you know there are two lords there. The Lord, that's the Heavenly Father, said unto my Lord, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And so that's the messenger of the covenant. And that is the one, is the mighty God. Look at Isaiah. Isaiah, I'm reading from chapter 9 and verse 6. Isaiah, chapter 9 and verse 6. It says in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, For unto us a child is born. Who is that? Unto us a son is given. Who is that? And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Who is that? And his name shall be called Wonderful. Who is that? Counselor. Who is that? The mighty God. Who is that? Jesus. And so there is the messenger of the covenant. He is the Lord. He says, the Lord, whom you are expecting, whom you are waiting for, he will come. He is the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace. There shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon the king, upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever and the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. It will be done. Haggai chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2. Malachi has told us that messenger of the covenant, he is coming, and you're expecting him, and it will suddenly appear in his temple. Malachi, chapter, uh, sorry, Haggai chapter 2, and here we're reading from verse 7. It says in verse 7, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. The desire of all nations shall come. That's the Lord Jesus Christ is coming again. I said, it's coming again. And then he goes on to say, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. And uh, so you come to Malachi now, chapter 3. And Malachi chapter 3 is telling us, behold, the Almighty God is promising and prophesying and saying, is declaring, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. The Lord and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Thank God we delight in the Lord. You are born again, we delight in the Lord. You're seeking the kingdom of God first and his righteousness, you delight in the Lord. It says, Behold, he shall come, says. The Lord of hosts. And today, we're looking at this message, preparation for the messenger of the covenant. Preparation for the messenger of the covenant. Because the Lord says, I'm sending him, and he's coming. And because I'm sending him, you need to receive him. And you need to prepare that he will be yours. There are three points we're talking about. Number one, Christ's revelation in his temple at his second coming. Christ's revelation is coming, it's going to be revealed, and it's going to appear. It's going to come. Christ's revelation in his temple 
at his second coming. Point number two, complete restoration of all tithes into his sanctuary. Complete restoration of all the tithes into his sanctuary. And then number three, continual remembrance of the triumphant in his service. I pray you'll be in his service. You see, there's a special remembrance and a special blessing for those who are serving the Lord. That's why the Lord is calling upon us. Don't be idle. Don't be left out. Make sure that you're one of the servants of the Lord and you're serving the Lord this capacity or that capacity and the Lord will bless your service for the Lord in Jesus' name. Let's come to number one. What's your number one there? Wonderful. Christ's revelation in his temple at his second coming. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 1. Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, shall assist the Lord of us. Look at verse 2. At but who shall abide, who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For, the, for he is like a refiner's fire, like the fuller's soap. Now you can tell that this is not referring to his first coming. When he came the first time, he came as a babe in the manger. He came, he was unto us, a child is born. He came as a child. But now you see, he's coming. And when he comes, he says, who shall abide? The day of his coming is referring to his second coming. Look at verse 3. And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and as silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Since when he comes, it's going to purify, it's going to purge, and it's going to sanctify the sons and the children of Levi. You know, he didn't do that the first time when he came. This is the second time. He's coming the second time. The messenger of the covenant, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah himself, he'll purify, he'll purge, he'll sanctify, and then he says they'll be able to offer the sacrifice in righteousness. Remember, for it says, Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. You remember when Christ came the first time, Jerusalem did not accept him. Judah did not accept him. Even when he told the disciples, ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. Jerusalem did not fully receive. And Judah did not fully receive. If you know where they were, where they were imprisoned and where they rejected them, it was in Jerusalem. But when it comes the second time, Christ is coming again. I say Christ is coming again. Then he says, the offering of Judah and the offering of Jerusalem shall be pleasant unto the Lord. Look at verse 5. And I will come near to you to judgment. And I will be a sweet witness against the sorcerers and against the, idol the adulterers and against the swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages and the widow and the fatherless and that turn aside the stranger from his right and fear not me says the Lord of us. It says when he comes, it's going to bring judgment upon the people that have not repented. He didn't do that at the first time when he came. All he came to do when he, when he came the first time he said, the son of man is come not to judge, not to destroy and not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's what he came for the first time. Is coming the second time. And when he comes the first, second time, it's going to bring judgment. And God says in verse 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. Thank God he changes not. All the promises he has given, all the prophecies we read about him, they be fulfilled because he says, I am God, I change not. Where he says, Therefore, ye sons of Jacob, 
are not consumed. And ye followers of Christ, you are not consumed. Are you there? I said, ye followers of Christ will not be consumed. Now you see this section that we're talking about, Christ's revelation in his temple at his second coming. There are three things here. Number one, preparation for Christ's return. Preparation for Christ's return. Number two, purifier of the chosen race. Purifier of the chosen race. We're talking about Judah. We're talking about the Levites. We're talking about Jerusalem. And he says he'll see it as a purifier. The purifier of the chosen race. Number three, the punishment for corrupted reprobates. Punishment for corrupted reprobates. Look at them one by one. In Malachi chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. Malachi chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. Preparation for Christ for Christ's return. is a coming. Thank God you'll be ready. I will be ready. And if I will be ready, I know you will be ready. We shall be ready in Jesus' name. It says, Behold, I will send my messenger. And he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek, we're seeking the Lord. We seek him in salvation. We seek him in sanctification. We seek him in service. We seek him in sacrifice. As we lay everything down before the Lord, and we say, All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. We seek him in surrender. And those who have come to the Lord, you have surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. You are born again. You have surrendered further. You are sanctified. You have surrendered further. You say, I'm not going to spend all my time, 24 hours of the day, 168 hours in the week, spend everything totally on myself, not spending anything on evangelism, anything for Christ, anything for the service of Christ. I cannot do that. He gave this all for me. I am going to give myself to him. I surrender my time. I surrender my talent. I surrender my treasure unto him. Ye that seek the Lord by salvation. Seek the Lord by sanctification. Seek the Lord by service. Seek the Lord by surrender. Seek the Lord by sacrifice. That you give everything you've got unto him. He says, he shall suddenly come to his temple. He shall suddenly come to his temple. Where will you be when Christ comes? Will you be on the street roaming about? Will you be in the nightclub? Will you be in the temple of the Lord joyfully, happily serving the Lord? He'll come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come. He says, don't have any shadow of doubt in your heart. Behold, he shall come. He says, look at all the signs of the age. And look at all the signs of the time. Look at the earthquakes we're reading about. About, and look at all the tornadoes we're reading about, and look at all the arrests we're reading about, look at all the insecurity we're reading about, and understand that these are the signs. And Jesus said, When you see these signs in your rising, you know that He is at the door, even as that now is about to come. He shall come, says the Lord of hosts, but who may be able to, who may, who may abide the day of His coming, and who shall stand. When he appeared, for he is like a refiner's fire and like the fuller's soap. Well, he tells us very clearly here that he is coming. And we need to prepare for his coming. Look at Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, he's telling us how the preparation should be and what the preparation ought to look like. In Luke chapter 1, here reading from verses 16 and 17, the preparation we make. He tells us in verse 16, it says, And many of the children of Israel shall be turned to the Lord their God. We turn to the Lord in repentance. We turn to the Lord. We make our institutions. We turn to the Lord. We become righteous before the Lord. And it is that returning to the Lord, that restoration to the Lord, that shows that you're getting ready. You are preparing. You say, I know my Lord is coming. He's coming to take the saints so not the sinners. He's coming to take the believers so not the unbelievers. He's coming to take those who are following him. He's coming to take them, not those who are following the world. And therefore, your heart is turned to the Lord. Your mind is turned to the Lord. And you say, I'm totally, completely, unreservedly turned unto the Lord. I'm getting ready for his coming. Look at verse 17. And he shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn, to turn, to turn the hearts of the fathers 
to the children. You know what we ought to be doing in our ministry? If we're going to prepare people for the coming of the Lord, we're preparing them. We're not just entertaining people. We're not just demonstrating or dramatizing anything. What are we doing? We're turning the minds of people unto the Lord. Any area of work you have in the church, you're turning the minds of people to the Lord. Even as a believer, as a believer, you have no excuse not to be working for the Lord. Everybody is a worker. Every believer is a worker in the sight of the Lord. Only that you have been hiding and dodging, but the Spirit of God will bring you out. And all those talents you have, all those privileges you have, all those uh, training you got, you come and use them for the kingdom of God, and then you will turn many souls into the kingdom of the Lord in Jesus' name. Do you remember what Malachi said? Malachi said, when he comes, who shall be able to abide the day of his coming? That's what we read about in Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, and I'm reading here from verse 12. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, Malachi said, He is coming, and when he comes, who will abide the time, the day, the period, and the epoch of his coming? And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of air, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when it is when she is shaken of by of a mighty wind, and the heaven departed as a scroll. When it is rolled together and every mountain and eyelash were moved out of their places and the kings of the earth, look at this, and the great men, look at that, and the rich men, look at that, and also the chief uh, captains and, and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the days and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Listen to verse 17. For the day, the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? That's why we'll prepare. If uh, you know all you have is money, all you have is riches, all you have is position, all you have is you know things of this world. When it comes, the rich men and the great men and the captains and, and all the people will not be able to it will not be able to abide. They will hide and they will say, Let the rocks fall on us. Because a Malachi said, But who shall be able, who shall abide the day of his coming? In this section, there's another thing here is the purifier of the chosen race. The purifier of the chosen race. Malachi chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Malachi chapter 3. And we're looking at verses uh, 3 and 4. And he shall see it as a refiner and purifier of silver. He shall see it as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi. You see, at this time now, the Lord is working on the Gentiles. At this time now, it's the Gentiles that are not receiving the grace for salvation and the grace for sanctification. Of course, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But Israel is not responding now because this is the time of the Gentiles. But when the times of the Gentiles will be over, then the Lord will face the people who are the Jewish people. That's the time when he comes back again, when the church has gone up in the rapture. And the church is no more here. Now the Lord will face the children of Israel. He'll purify them. First of all, he'll pardon them. He'll give them salvation. Number two, he will purify them. He will give them sanctification. He will purge them. He will empower them and fill them with the Holy Ghost. And he'll be his mouthpiece at that time to the rest of the world. He then, then he says in verse 4, he says, Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old, as in former 
years. What does that mean? In the days of old, in former years, he concentrated on Israel. You, you, remember, you remember David? He concentrated on Israel. You remember Solomon? Concentrated on Israel. You remember all those good kings, Asa, Ezekiah? They concentrated on Israel. You remember all their prophets? They concentrated on Israel. Elijah, Elisha, and all the other prophets. Even Jonah, that was one saint to the Gentiles, to Nineveh, he said, no, I will not go because I'm just to concentrate on the children of Israel. Now the Lord has raised up ministers and preachers for the Gentile world. And when the Gentile people have received the gospel and the church is, uh, you know, well prepared and rapturable, and Christ comes and the church is gone, then he'll go back to those uh, people again as in the years of old. We'll concentrate upon them. But at this time now, it is the time of the Gentiles. But the time of the Gentiles will soon be over. And before the times of the Gentiles uh, come over, get saved quickly. Thank God you are saved. I'm talking to somebody. I said, thank God you are saved. And then uh, make sure that you are serving the Lord. Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. I'm reading from verse 24. It says in Luke 21, 24. I'm waiting for you to open. Luke chapter 21, verse 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword. It's talking about Israel there. Talking about Judah there. The people, the descendants of Abraham. And shall be led away captive into all nations. That is, uh, all those uh, Jewish people be carried away to all nations at this time. That's what has happened. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. If you have uh, read your news very well, there has been battle over Jerusalem, this part of Palestine, that part of Palestine, all that at the time of the Gentiles. Look at this. It says they shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And when that time has been fulfilled, now Christ will come. The church is gone. And now the great tribulation is taking place. And that great tribulation will be a purifying kind of agent on the children of Israel. And they will call upon the name of their God. And then we're told, uh, look at uh, Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. We're reading here from verse 10. Daniel Chapter 12, and we're reading from verse 10. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 10, uh, listen to what it says. Many shall be purified. That's at that time when Christ will come. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked that shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. It's talking about that time of the great tribulation when the children of Israel will pass through the fire. Fire of refining and fire of purifying and then eventually punishment will come upon the unbelievers. Come back to Malachi chapter 3 I'm reading from verse 5. Punishment for corrupted reprobates. Punishment for corrupted reprobates. It tells us in verse 5, and I will come near to you to judgment and I will be a sweet witness against the sorcerers. Thank God I'm not a sorcerer. Somebody there says, thank God you are not a sorcerer. We must get out of all those things because you see, all those who live in that, whatever they think they're gaining by being sorcerers or witches or wizards, what are you gaining? Because that's going to end up in judgment, in everlasting fire. It says, I will come near to you to judgment and I will be a sweet a, a witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against the false wearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages. Do you know that scene? There's a people that say, I'm not a sinner, I'm not a sinner, and the workers who are working for them, and the people who are serving them, they do not pay them their right deal, and it says God is going to bring judgment upon them, and you know something here, he puts the people who are oppressing the poor, and the people who are oppressing their employees, he puts them in the same category as the witches and the adulterers, so it's not enough to say, I'm not an adulterer, I'm not, uh, you know, this and not that. Are you paying people their deal? And then it goes on to say against the false wearers and against the those that oppress the hiding in their wages and the widows and the fatherless and that turn aside the stranger from his right 
And uh, it goes on to say, and you fear not me, says the Lord. And for you to understand, it says, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to relent. I'm not going to change my mind. It says, for I am God, I change not. They're therefore the sons of Jacob are not consumed. Judgment is coming. I pray you will not pass through that period of judgment. Salvation is for everyone who will call upon the Lord today. And once you are saved, praise the Lord. That kind of judgment is over. Point number two now. Complete restoration of all the tithes in his sanctuary. Complete restoration of all the tithes in his sanctuary. And let's come to uh, Malachi chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 7. Even from the days of old uh, of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances, and I have not kept them. Return to me. You see, what the Lord was challenging them, it wasn't to condemn them. Sometimes when the challenge comes to us, we feel, okay, I'm guilty. Okay, I'm under judgment. Now I'm under this or under that. He's telling us so that we'll not remain in that condition. Return unto me. You will return. And I will return unto you, says the Lord of hosts. But she said, wherein shall we return? You see these people, as the Lord said, I'm waiting for you here. Return. I'm waiting for you here. Repent. I'm waiting for you. I want to bless you. Why are you staying far away? They said, okay, we're going to return. But how are we going to return? And then the Lord began to tell them in verse 8, Will a man rob God? Yet she have robbed me. But she say, Wherein have we robbed thee? You see, every time God says, they say the controversy I have against you. And they say the commandment I'm giving to you, they will say, but what have we done? Where, wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? Ye are cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. And he made clear, he said, you are cursed with a curse. He said, we can reverse that curse. He will reverse the curse. I said they will reverse the cause. And that's why he told them in verse 10, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, says the Lord, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. And outpouring is coming. And pour you out a blessing. It will pour upon your head. And pour upon your family. And pour upon your business. Look at the amen I'm getting from our people. He will pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast a fruit before the time in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed. For ye shall be a delightsome land, says the Lord of hosts. And that, that's the promise of the Lord. And it's going to fulfill it in Jesus' name. Check up your Bible. I'm not sure you're going to find any other place where God said, Do this, and I will do this. Prove me. Test me. And examine me. And you do that, and I'm going to surprise you. If you will follow the Lord this year wholeheartedly, in all you see the Lord is revealing to us, it will surprise you with miracle. It will overload you with miracle. Prove me here with, if I will not open the windows of heaven and, and pour you out a blessing that you will not be able to receive it. That is, you will not have enough room to receive. And let me look at some few things here. Number one, uh, for it says, uh, this is faithfulness rewarded. Faithfulness rewarded. Look at it in verse 10. It says, prove me now if I will not open the windows of heaven. That is, if you are faithful, I'm going to reward that faithfulness. Number one, faithfulness rewarded. Number two, fullness received. Fullness received. Look at that in verse 10. It says, I'll pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. You receive a fullness. There will not be enough a room to receive that. Number one, it's faithfulness rewarded. Number two, it's fullness received. Number three, false rebuild. False rebuild. Look at verse 11. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. All your foes, all your enemies, the Lord will say, don't come near here. 
stand clear. This one is a precious child of God, and the business and the work of your heart is so protected and precious that it says, I will rebuke the devourers for your sake. The foes rebuked. Number four, fruitfulness regained. Fruitfulness regained. Because it says in verse 11, and it shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. All the destruction of the past, there will be a restoration to your business. A restoration to the work of your hand. Because it says there is fruitfulness regained. Number five, fertility restored. Fertility restored. It says neither shall your vine cast their cast, uh, cast her fruit before the time. It says fertility will be restored. And then number six, favor Recognize the favor of God upon you will be recognized because it says in verse 12, and all nations shall call you blessed. It says, if you will do what I'm telling you, and you will bring all the tithes into the storehouse, it says the favor of you, the favor of God will be recognized. And then number seven, the future reassured. The future reassured because it says, for you shall be a delightsome land, says the Lord of hosts. I come back to verse 10. It says in verse 10, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that, that, that there, may be, there may be meat in mine house, and put me now herewith, if I will not open the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Look up here. There are some people that uh, will tell you, if you listen to them, thank God, we don't listen to false prophets. I said we don't listen to false teachers. You're not listening to them in Jesus' name. Oh, they will say that uh, uh, the law is, uh, is the law of Moses that, uh, you know, spoke about tithes and offering. There's nothing like that anymore. That, you know, whatever you want to give, if you have a hundred naira, you want to give only one cover, they say that's your, that's your decision. If you have a hundred naira, you want to give a ninety naira, and they say that's your decision. If you have a thousand dollars, you want to give only one dollar to the Lord, that's your decision. And if you decide to give a uh, nine hundred and eighty, of the 1,000 to the they say that's your decision. They say God doesn't uh, talk about, uh, you know, tithes and offering. Only, Mo only Moses spoke about it. I want to tell you that Abraham commenced it. Abraham commenced it. And Jacob continued it. Now, Moses commanded it. That's 400 years after Abraham had commenced it. And Christ commended it. And none can cancel it. Number one, Abraham commenced it. It started from the time of Abraham. Number two, Jacob continued it. And number three, Moses now commanded it in the law. And number four, Christ commanded it. And number five, none can cancel it. Let, let's come to the first time tithes and offering uh, was mentioned. We're looking at Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14. And here we're reading from verse 18. Uh, Abraham had gone to the battlefield and God had given him the victory. And then a great personality met him. His name Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, we're told in Hebrews chapter 7, is like unto the very Son of God. And look at this in uh, Genesis chapter 14. And we're reading from verse 18. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem. That word Salem means peace. Uh, when in the Hebrew people say Shalom, you know, in their language later, and that is peace. The king of peace, that, that's the king of Shalom. And the king of, uh, that's Melchizedek. And he brought bread and wine. And do you remember what Jesus said? This is my body, which is broken for you. That's the bread. And then he brought the cup and he said, This is my blood, which is shed for you. He says, Drink ye all of it. And every time you do this, you do that in remembrance of me. That's what Melchizedek, the one that is made after the similitude of, uh, you know, the Son of God. That's what he brought to Abraham. And then gave him bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High, Jesus Christ. Christ is our high priest, and he blessed him, and, he, and, and said, Blessed be Abraham of the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. Listen to this, and blessed, blessed be the most high God, 
which has delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he, Abraham, gave him tithes of all. Moses was not born yet. This is not the law. This is the time of Abraham. And it says, we who are born again now, we have the seed of Abraham. And as Abraham did, and we are walking in the footsteps of Abraham, that's why you're not bringing your tithes. You're not giving the tithes to man. You're giving to Melchizedek. You're giving to the Lord Jesus Christ, who has sacrificed, who gave you his body, and who shed his blood for you. He gave you the bread and the wine. And you say, in recognition of what you've done for me, here is one tenth of everything I have, and you give unto the Lord. Abraham commenced it. Jacob continued it. We're looking at Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28. And I'm reading here from verse 20. Genesis 20, chapter 28 verse 20. And Jacob uh, vowed a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in, the, in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and uh, raiment to put on. Stop there for a moment. Look at the prayer of Jacob here. If the Lord will, if God will be with me, what did Jesus say? I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I am with you till the end of the world. That's that part of the request of a Jacob, which is the request the Lord has answered for you. And will keep me in this way that I go. What did Jesus say on us praying? He says, Holy Father, keep them from the evil. He said, I'm not praying that you'll take them out of the world, but that you will keep them. He's keeping us. And then he says, I will give them, will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on. What did Jesus say? Seek ye for the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all this thing that the Gentiles are seeking, I will, will be added unto you. Then he said, if you do that, this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be, shall be God's house and of all that thou shalt give me. Think about this. Of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the taste unto thee. Moses had not arrived. Moses did not teach Jacob this. But you see, Abraham commenced it, and Jacob continued it. It was later that that uh, one came talking about uh, talking about uh, Jacob, uh, talking about uh, the tithes. And now when you come to the New Testament, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, uh, I'm reading from verse 1. You know, as you open up and you give to the Lord, the Lord will give unto you without measure, beyond measure. And this year will be your year of breakthrough in Jesus' name. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 1. It says, now concerning the collections uh, for the saints, uh, as I have given order uh, to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye upon the first day of the week, which is the first day of the week today. Isn't it? Upon the first day of the week Sunday, let every one of you lay by him a store as God has prospered him. You understand that language? That's the language of uh, the accountant. As God has uh, prospered him. That's the proportion. What's proportion? That's percentage. What's the least percentage? Ten percent. That is one tenth, one over ten, or ten over hundred. Ten percent of what you've got. That's the proportion. As God has prospered him, that there be no gathering when I come. What's that, what does that mean? That means that when there's a need, now we want to do this in the church of God. We want to preach. We want to transmit, uh, you know, the message of the kingdom to all the people that need to hear. We want to build a local church. We want to build a constant church. We want to pay the people that have given their whole life uh, to serving the Lord because they're not doing any other work. And this is the only way they can receive the, you know, remuneration and uh, the pay for their service, a little pay that uh, they'll be able to maintain themselves and their families so that they will not be making announcements who are going to gather together for a special uh, meeting on a Wednesday on a Friday. We cannot pay our workers. We cannot do this. No, it says on the first day of the week, as we gather together like this, 
says, let everyone lay each by store. That means before you come to church on Saturday, and you, you, have, you read your Sunday scripture, and you prepare, and you read your Bible, and you put your hymn book aside, by the way, I want to talk to the parents that, you know, the parents, you're not buying him books for your children. And when we're singing, our youths, they don't have any hymn book. Uh, because we're seeing that once we've bought the Bible, we've done everything. No, your child must have the hymn book. The youths must have the hymn book. And the fathers and the mothers must have the hymn book. And then as we're coming to the Lord, uh, you know, sometimes uh, when we say now, raise up your offering, I will look in the youth's direction we know they are not working, but you are training them. You are bringing them up. Before on Saturday, this is what you are going to contribute in the church. This is what you are going to give. And then father will have his own. Mother will have his own. It says on that day that there be no gathering when I come. And it says when I come, and whatsoever ye shall approve by your letters. Them will I say to bring your liberality to Jerusalem. You know what that means? It means, you know, there's a local church there, local church there, local church there, and then you all bring the ties, and then we we'll send it to the headquarters, and your liberality. Now your liberality, if you have a hundred uh, naira, and you give uh, one naira, are you liberal? Tell me now. Why is it when we talk about money, then you keep quiet? When I begin to talk, I say, okay, no money, no money. Now, miracle. You say, praise the Lord, pastor. And then you say, amen. Uh-huh, miracle will come. Now we're talking about money. Give me a good amen. amen. And so, liberality. When you have, a, you know, the least you can do is the tithes and the offering. To be liberal. In fact, you go beyond one-tenth. You go beyond 10%. That's why it says tithes. That's one-tenth. And offering. The offering that is added to that. That's your liberality. And you know, the more you give to the Lord, this year you are going to begin a new style of giving. A new approach of giving. And I'm seeing the riches and prosperity upon your life already. You know, all the canker worms and the caterpillars, the Lord will rebuke everything. You will not spend your money on sickness. Give the money to God. You'll not have to go and give it in the hospital. Give your money to God. You'll not have to go and give it to the strangers. Because and what you give, the Lord will repay you. And the Lord will bless you abundantly in Jesus' name. You know, some of these the teachers, they tell us that Jesus never spoke about tithes and offering. Uh -uh. They have not read their Bible very well. Matthew chapter 23, I'm reading from verse 23. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. It tells us in verse 23. It says over here, Matthew 23 and verse 23. It says, warn to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye pay tithes of mint and anise, and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Uh, you know what the Lord is saying here? The uh, Pharisees, they were meticulous about paying their tithes. But righteousness, uh-uh. Salvation, uh-uh. Sanctification, no, no. Love of God, no, no. Helping other people, no, no. Helping the one that was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. And they was uh, left up dead by the robbers. They will not take care of that person. Only tithes and offering. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is let there be salvation. Let there be sanctification. Let there be Holy Ghost baptism. Let there be evangelism. Let there be helping the poor. Let there be caring for the widows. Let there be caring for the fatherless. And let there be your tithes and offering. I'm going to read that again. Now you understand better. Won't to use scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye pay the tithes of a mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Listen to this. And uh, it says, and, and judgment and mercy and faith, the omitted mercy and faith and justice, these ought she to have done. What's that? The tithes are doing, that's all right. That's all right. These ought she to have done and not to have left the other undone. What she, what she condemned them for is that they left mercy, they left faith, they left the love of God, and they left the caring for the poor, and they only concentrate on tithes and offering. He said, balance everything together. These such it you have done, you should pay your tithe, and not only tithe, tithe and offering, and be liberal. And if you are liberal, God will be liberal upon your life. 
and this year you are going to receive greater in the hand of the Lord in Jesus name he'll wipe your tears away he will, he will change everything that needs any change in your life, in your surrounding, in Jesus' name. Come back to Malachi. I'm reading from chapter 3. Come back to Malachi chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 10. It says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. Uh, bring ye. What was the next word? Bring ye. What's the next word there? Tell me out loud. All, all the tithes, you know, uh, the people that, uh, you know, will say, now raise up your tithes and offering, and they don't make any calculation. Tithe is one tithe. Every month, if you're a salary earner, you'll calculate, you say, this is one tithe. If, uh, you know, you earn income in another way, you calculate, this is one tithe. And it says, you bring all the tithes. And if you bring all the tithes, no wonder all the blessings you ought to get in the past, you were not getting. But this year, you'll get everything. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse and let your children have their contribution. The wife must have a contribution. The husband is contribution. Everyone is contribution. Because, you know, if uh, the blessing is going to pour on everyone, everyone must have something they expecting. I have done the will of God. I brought my tithes. I brought my offering. I'm expecting this. And God will not be debtor to anybody. He will, he will give you what he said he'll give you. I thought you'll say amen. amen. Prove me and prove me now. Here we, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven. Those windows are opening. And pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. This church will not be oppressed by any devourer. And every work of your hand, it will bless and preserve. And ye shall not destroy the fruit of your ground, and the fruit of your womb, and the fruit of your service, and the fruit of your labor. Neither shall your vine cast a fruit before the vine in the field. Neither shall your wife cast the baby uh, before the birth in your family. Miscarriage will be cancelled. Says the Lord of hosts, and all nations shall call you blessed. All nations shall call you blessed. You know, there's some people, uh, because uh, they are not doing what the Lord wants them to do. And then they are living from, almost living from hand to mouth. And, uh, you know, their neighbors see them. And then they say, come to church. Come to our church. Which church? I don't want to go to the church of the poor. They will not say that anymore. The church of the blessed. And the church of the outpouring. And the church of prosperity. And the church of those who are free. When you see, you know, you, if you, you say, you have, I'm of deeper life, I'm of deeper life. And then you are telling your neighbors, uh, the witches are troubling me. Where do you go if you had the problem before? They say, ah, but you're deeper life. If you now invite them to church, I don't want to go to the church of the oppressed. But the church of those who are free. This year you are free. Somebody there said you are free. All those oppressors, they will not touch your life anymore in Jesus' name. Because all the nations and all your neighbors will call you blessed. They will look at you, they say, what do you eat? I'm looking at you the way you are. And I know that, you know, it's not easy everywhere, but for you, everything is easy. Before you invite them, they say, I will go with you. I said they will come with you. Because the blessings of God, everybody will see it on your life. And ye shall be a delight. Some you are listening to our pastor, Pastor W. F. Kumoye, or other anointed minister of God from our ministry. Let the words sink in your heart, and they will do you good throughout your whole life. It is our belief by the grace of the Lord. That you will come and worship with us at Deeper Light Bible Church, Fort, number 4656 Bravo Drive. We have our service every Sunday from 9 a.m. to 11:30, and we have our Bible study on every Monday from 7 to 8:30. As you are doing so, and the grace of the Lord will continue to be with you, and you will never be the same. Thank you. God bless you.